So let okay. All right, is my is the screen big enough? The text. You can increase it a little bit. Yeah. Is that good? Yes, perfect. Okay. All right. So um, we're on chapter chapter twelve here, doing the exercises. Um. So some of these are are more conceptual, and some of them are more applied. Um. The first one is just proving um this algorithm for 4k means um honestly like i can sort of follow it but it, a lot of it is um a little too adept for me um so i'll trust that, that 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 dan's answers are correct um but it seems like he's able to drop some of the terms in the in the equation because it's um it all balances out um but again, the, the, the main point here is that the k-means algorithm um, minimizes the distance um, in each centroid. So, so it also minimizes that, that within cost of variance. Um, this one is a little more applied. Um, so if you get a dissimilarity matrix like this, um, they want you to sketch out the tree, um, comment on, on, on when the fusions occur, um, and things like that. So he just builds a matrix here and then does and then applies the, the, the this clustering function to get a C1 object. Um, and that's you know your basic tree there. Um, so you can see that the one and two that side of the, that section of the tree is a little deeper than the others, but these are probably more similar than these, but not much because it's only a difference in the height of 0.3 to maybe 0.35 or 0.45. Um, so that, that was with the complete um, method. And then single, it, it builds a more nested structure. Um, so we have these fusion points here. So one and two are similar. Three is, is um, in between this cluster and four, which is in its own cluster. Um, because it's hierarchical, these are nested. So this cluster here belongs to this cluster here if you cut about that height. Um, so here he's just cutting it at different heights. Um, so if he gets, if he wants two clusters, then it assigns um, the first two observations to the first cluster and the, and the second two to the second cluster. And then with that other dendrogram, he cuts it in two, or he cuts it for two clusters and the first three observations are in one cluster, and the fourth is by itself. And that aligns with the graph here. So these three here are together, and this one's separate. Um, so this question is about um, just showing again that the that the x-axis on these graphs on the horizontal part is is not relevant at all right is only it, you can display the horizontal you can order them 100 different ways um it doesn't tell you about anything about their similarity so here you're just switching the location of one and two compared to that first graph um but the, again like it doesn't change the interpretation Um, so here he's doing k-means manually. So it, it, it's one of those algorithms that iterates. Um, so we have six observations and two features, x1, x2. Um, so just a quick plot. 
you, you can eyeball it right now. There's there's probably two clusters there that make sense. Um, so here he's just assigning um, the clusters randomly and then computing the centroid with S supply and the call means function. Um, and then finding um, which which observation is is each observation to the centroid which is closest in terms of that distance, and then assign those labels. So here he's finding that distance, and then um, using apply on the on the dist object with which min, and and then he's doing that. This code will will iterate on that. Um, but here he's, he he shows that you get the the um, stable clusters after the first go around. Um, so again, it matches your your eye test. You got two different clusters here. Um, so this one is about the fusion points and the height of the fusion when you're using different linkage methods. Um, so with yeah, so single is it takes the lowest distance and complete takes the higher, right? I believe that's, that's correct, yeah. Um, so we says probably there might be a difference. Single or the complete might be higher, but um, but there's probably not enough information in that question to tell. Um, I think I agree with that, but it's kind of fuzzy. Um, so here there's different numbers of, of nodes in the clusters that are being fused. Uh, but here we have singleton nodes. So we have one observation in each. And if they fuse, since the since the algorithms that that they're talking about above are for nodes with multiple observations, they behave um, the same when the clusters only have one observation. Um, so you're not going to see a difference. Um, Okay, so this is going back to that that example of, of the shopper behavior based on their sh on their shopping history. Um, you have people that are buying a, a lot of socks in varying numbers and then computers, and obviously you buy more socks for, than computers, so the scale is different there, and so the and so the variance is also different. Um, so if you if you scale them. He argues, and I think I agree that that it adjusts the variance, um, and so the 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 computer indicator will will have more weight. Um, whereas if if you don't scale it and just just take it in the raw number of items sold, then since the variance in the in the socked um, measurements is much higher. The algorithm will weight that more. Um, so here it just goes through that that math. Um, honestly, I, I didn't I didn't have a chance to look at this. Um, I don't know if you have any questions on on question six. This is when I had to skip it this week. I just didn't have time to get through it. Um, but we can talk about it at the end if you want to. Um, seven, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So question seven, um, going back to the, this USRS data, um, talking about ways to split the nodes in the tree of the hierarchy using either distance uh, you got two measures here, correlation and Euclidean. Um, and, and the authors say that if you scale the input data 
then the two measures are basically the same. Um, so here he takes the US arrest data, scales it, applies the distance function and the correlation, and then plots those against each other. And here we can see that they're 100%, basically 100% correlated. Um, so just something to think about when you're doing your data preparation on unsupervised learning. Again, if you if you, you think carefully about whether you have to scale the data, because that will change the results. Um, so here we have proportion of variance explained, um, going through different ways to calculate that. So here you can use the SDEV uh, output of the of the PR comp function. Uh, so here he's referencing that here with the dollar sign. Um, but you can also just do it manually here um, with the call sums, and here shows that the results are the same. Um, so going back to the USRS data and higher up clustering. Um, yeah, so he does it with complete and then cuts it. So he gets three clusters and shows which which state, which state each or which cluster each state belongs to. Um, so then he again he scales it. Uh, but I don't know if, if you caught this or maybe I'm misreading his code, but it seems like he's he should be referencing the, the HC2 object here and CT. This should be called CT2, I guess. Because his output is is I think it's the same. Alabama, Arkansas, Connecticut. Yeah, Alabama, Arkansas, Connecticut. So I think he's he accidentally I just copied the wrong object name. Um so um if we can just re re redo that code real quick. Um The clustering on that data using the complete method. Um, so this is unscaled. Um, so you have maybe two cluster, maybe two main clusters, or maybe even three, depending on, on how you want to think about that. Um, so if you cut it, so you get three clusters. These are the assignments that matches his code and his output. Um, and then if you was add that assignment back to the original table and count on the cluster, then we can see that the, the first cluster has 16 states, second has 14, and the third has 20. Um, and then if you scale it and plot that, um, here there's a, there's a, I'd say that there's stronger evidence for two clusters there, and then some, some, clus some sub clusters under that. Um, and with the scale data, Alaska is sort of a singleton out there. It's not as similar to um, the rest of the of the observations in that part of the tree. Um, and then if you cut it, so you have three. And here I'm assigning it to C two and using H C two. And here, um, so the first cluster only has eight observations, second has 11, and third has 31. So, so with the, if you scale it, you get a different, um, you get a one smaller cluster and a one bigger cluster. One, uh, okay. I think one challenge I used to have when it comes to uh, radical clustering is about the number of, uh, clusters in which we are because now we are using the code tree function from stats and we are specifying the number of clusters should be three. Is there any algorithm in which we can use an R in which it can tell us the precise number of clusters and we are going to use from scratch before? Um, I think it's sort of like k-means. There's no right answer, but but you can see where there's diminishing returns. You can do that sort of screen plot. I had a, um, if I can pull it up, I had a, 
I was looking for some code earlier and I got um so in the facto extra package, I think it is. Yeah, so they have this um this function here that does that that screen plot. Um but it's for the cluster it's for, it's for the hierarchical clustering. So you can see that that after about the third cluster, the returns start to diminish. Um, so that's one way to do it. Here, I'll put that in the chat. Um, yeah, so again, there's, there's no right answer, but um, but um, but there's definitely ways to, to to compare compare that, and you can make your choice based on the on the context of your problem. Um, but so so going back to the um, the main page here, um, again, uh, there's no right answer, as it says here. Like these are already scaled. Sort of arbitrarily, it could be measured per million instead of per hundred thousand. Um, so that's you know the scale really doesn't tell us anything more about the data in that respect. Um, so since so he says since the scale is arbitrary, then you should scale it, which probably probably makes sense. Um, okay, so here we're going to generate some data um, and then do PCA and K means on that to sort of compare the output. Um, so here is using R norm um, and inventing some, some class labels and then applying some, um, or what do they call it, mean shifting here just to get um, some separation between our classes. Um, so here we're doing principal components on that and comparing the first two components there. And then it's being colored by the class label there. So you can see there's, you know, there's maybe three clusters just eyeballing it with some overlap. Um, you know, I could imagine this, this point could be green and this point could be blue, right? They're, they're all pretty close. Um, so, so then we do k-means with three clusters and compare the k-means output to the actual label. Um, so here it, it does pretty well. Um, you know, misses on misses. You know, it's unsupervised, so it's hard to say what a miss is. But um, puts puts twenty out of the twenty-two or it puts all 20 of, of B in cluster one and, and one of, cluster, of A into cluster one and one of C into cluster one. 19 is, or um, second cluster is all C and the third cluster is, is all A except for that one. Um, so here we do with K equals two and just presenting that as a table. Um, so cluster one is a split of A and B and cluster two is pretty much all C except for two there in A. So four, um, one is, is sort of a mix of B and C with no A. Um, cluster two is basically all A. Three is, is purely C and four is mostly B with some from um, class A. Um, so then they do K means on the principal components, on the first first two principal components. Um, here it 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 um so because we're projecting that into a lower dimension space um, and preserving maximizing some of that variance between the components, um, the K means will 
well, if you if you put that into the key means, it'll also do well. It separates those into pretty into three pretty good clusters. Um, I didn't understand what he meant by less well. Because here is this is basically the same as the first one. I think he's just taking the k means with with three, scaling it. Whereas the first one is k means with three not scaled, and it's twenty one nineteen nineteen. Yeah, it looks the same to me. 121, 19, and 19. So I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm missing what he's, what he's saying there. I don't know if you have a different interpretation. The formulas well, can we see the first, the next one? Yeah, so this is the scaled version. And the okay. first one is Yeah, I can't see anything there. We still have the same one one twenty one there. They are almost the same. Yeah. So I'm I'm I don't know what he meant by that. Let me see. Can we see the scale data? Uh, So, I mean, I think based on the code, it seems like there's there's not <clears throat> there's eyeballing it. I, I don't see a difference in variance between the classes. I mean, the values are different between them, um, but whether the overall variance is, is, and obviously it's been scaled, so it's a variance with a, a big standard deviation of one, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what he's what he's saying there. Less well. Something, yeah. Let me see if I can reproduce that. One twenty one, nineteen, and nineteen. Oops. Why is it taking me back to the, I want to copy the code, not, sorry about that. Now I'm in the wrong chapter, how did that happen? Um,
right? Exact same things, but we're just scaling. Ah, okay. So maybe there was something with, with his code. Let me restart my session and just one, two. Maybe there was something in his code that didn't quite. Yeah, okay, so it does give different results on my end. Right, and two, we're scaling this data, k equals two. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, it does look different to me. Yep. So, so in this case, the scaling um produces less i guess pure clusters there's more overlap between them there's only there's only there's, there's no pure clusters in the scaled stuff and there's two pure clusters in the unscaled so the the scaling um that variance, I guess, from the from the clustering perspective, makes the observations look more similar. That's well, my interpretation. So, well, in a case, so let me ask. Maybe in the case whether we collected those data, those data they were all of the same scale. Is it still right? We still scale the data again. If all the data they are of the same scale. Well, I guess, I guess they're probably not because they're 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 adding this for classes B and C. So I guess technically they're not of the same scale. Okay. But I mean, in real world situation, whereby we are collecting those data, we want to do. Uh, like the PCA, is this still right? We scale the data, or we, since they have the same scale, should we still scale it? I don't think it would change the results. Okay. I don't think so. I mean, it'll change the, the values in the, in the data, but the, assuming that all the columns have a standard deviation of one, I don't see how it would give different results. The same thing I'm thinking because the data is all of the same scale. So I think uh, it might not, it will not change. I think I agree with you. Don't change the results. It'll it change the, the, the values in the table, but, but the clustering result wouldn't change. Or my my team, I, I have to think about the about the values in the table. Um, okay, again, I, I I didn't have time to go through this one. I don't know if you if you did. Eleven. No. Um. So it's about the matrix completion. Um. But it, it's just a way, a way to, to show how the iteration in that algorithm works. Um, but I didn't, I didn't have time to go through it. Yeah, same with 12. Um, so I can, I'll skip to 13, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here we got that gene expression down the set. Um, so here we got a, a much bigger size of, of, of observation to work with here. Um, so the first 20 samples are healthy and the, and the second 20 are disease. Um, so here she's just applying. Applying that to the uh, data um, 
and then doing the clustering algorithm um, with the complete method. So here it separates out the, the healthy and um, diseased pretty cleanly. Whereas the average, um, there's like two, it still separates out the healthy and disease, but then there's, but there's, there's a, a subcluster that's nested under here and it splits out the healthy in the, in the two groups, which is interesting. Um, so again, same data, just different method. Um, and then with a single, um, and I think they talked about this in the chapter that, that the single method is, is prone to this sort of result. Um, so, you, I mean, I think the general advice is you, you should try all the methods and look at the, at the results. And because it really depends on the, on the context of the problem and there's no right answer. Um, so here they're asking about um, a way to know which genes differ most across the two groups. So I guess you, so here, here, I mean, you could do a t-test, right? That's what he shows here. Um, and set some threshold. He says that you, would be best achieved by a supervisor approach. So I wonder if he means like a classification. Uh, problem. Or like the, the, the question is, is the, is the observation diseased or not? And then you could, I guess, look at the coefficient of that gene. Is that what he's saying? Or, or, or like find the, the gene that has the, the highest coefficient in that regression. That, 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 that was my um, thought. But again, that's got looking at the, at the data set. Um, so 40 samples. And um, forty samples and a, a thousand observations, or a thousand, a thousand, um, thousand predictors. So that's your pretty high dimensionality there. So you'd have to think about your classification approach, um, but you could do it. We can go back to the uh, chapter four. Look at some of those methods for that. Any other thoughts on on these? I don't have much thought because I did not really have time to go through uh, the material. I was in the lab since uh, morning. I just came back now so that I can join the call. I do not have okay. much to go through the material. Yeah, I mean, there's. I think there's some interesting problems in there. In there, so there's definitely something to learn. Um, I also found um, there's the tidy cluster package, which um, it does like the tidy models approach for unsupervised learning. Um, so you can, um, so here, here they're using that, that this penguins data set. Um, they go through you know, a couple of the examples, the same as the book in terms of the, of the methodology. Um, but here you can, you can specify the clustering method so same idea as H clust, um, but in the tidy models like way. So it uses H clust 
H class like in the background, but this is like a wrapper on top of that. And then you can fit that with the data and produce a summary. And then you can plot it the same as you would base R, but then you can get, um, you can extract all the metadata about the, about the clusters, um, the same as you would with, with the tidy models. Like if you had a regression model or something, you get the centroids of each cluster, which is good for graphing. Um, and then you can use the predict function to apply um, the clustering algorithm and get the labels for the clusters. And you can join that back to the original data set with bind calls. Um, so if I had to if I had to do this in production, I'd probably use this because it's a little bit of a cleaner interface. Um, and then I was just looking through some some other code looking at how to do how to graph some of the stuff. Um, so um, this they go through like plotting and base R. Um, and how to do some labels and clean them up a little bit. Change some of the formatting. So like if you had to do a presentation on this stuff, like I think having a little bit of a cleaner look with some with some colors and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, 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 it drives you crazy that the the base R plot it puts the, the text vertically so you can't read it. So I much prefer that that, that presentation. Um, just different ways to show the the hierarchy there. These are cool. Uh, a little hard to interpret, but it looks cool. Um, so I, I thought that was an interesting. You know, if if you choose on the if you need to dig more into the data and, and look at more of the uh, of the patterns, it can be nice to have a little better looking graphs just for your own purposes even. All right, that's 12. Yeah, thank you. Let me just put stop.